Welcome to this week's edition of Outdoors Online, a weekly webcast produced by the North Dakota Game and Fish Department. I'm your host, Mike Anderson. Joining me today is Casey Anderson, Assistant Wildlife Chief here at Game and Fish. Today we're going to talk about how research using today's technologies help Game and Fish better manage wildlife. Casey, what technologies are we using today versus the past? Well, in the past, depends on how far back you want to go, but in you know, a lot of it was done, uh, we would maybe mark an animal by trapping it, and then somehow we had to relocate that animal, whether it was on horseback with binoculars or walking across the Badlands or even sometimes with a vehicle, but essentially it was just like a ear tag or a collar that didn't have any kind of transmitter but had some t type of color marking or number on it that we would then um, revisit to see where it was, what it was doing. Um, and then as you go forward, technology of course changes as, about as fast as we can figure out how to use it. Um, and we've gone from that all the way up to now we use some GPS collars that even send signals to your cell phone. And so <coughs> there's in between there, there's still technologies that we use. Uh, VHF is a very high frequency transmission collar. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a collar. It can be a backpack that we put on birds or, or collars that we put on uh, elk and deer. What's the difference between VHF collars and GPS collars? Well, a VHF collar is, it stands for very high frequency. So essentially it's a collar that puts out a frequency um, that only maybe our, our receiver can pick up. Um, and sometimes each animal will have a different frequency so we can tell which animal we're tracking. But on a, in most cases with a VHF, you have to physically be out in the field. Um, the only way to get data from a VHF collar is to triangulate where that animal is by being out in the field, whether that's by airplane, um, on the ground, on foot, or by vehicle. Um, and so you, you essentially have to get to three different sides to figure out where that animal is, and then you have to go in and, and take your data entry stuff, whether you're looking at the habitat it's using or what you're looking at. Um, with a GPS collar, those are based on satellites, just like a GPS that tells you where you are on your phone or, or the one you use hunting or whatever it is. Um, and so then that information then gets sent directly to, say, a cell phone of the person that is doing the study, um, a computer system somewhere that then logs that information. And so that's being calculated whether you set those collars to take a point every hour, every three hours, every day, um, it's being calculated automatically and then you could then go out later and maybe look at what was there um, or you could be there immediately as it's, as it's taking that point and see the animal without having to triangulate and things like that. And so it gathers information without us having to be out in the field all the time. Sure. So we have the VHF collars which basically a biologist has to go out in the field and, and, and mm -hmm. do telemetry and, and locate the animal. And, and, uh, and then we have GPS collars where uh, we put GPS collars on mountain lions, deer, uh, uh, moose, mm -hmm. elk, a lot of big game species, uh, even birds like you said. What kind of information are we finding out from these GPS collars? Well, the nice thing with the GPS collars is we can really get a lot of information with little man hours. Um, once you have those collars out there, you can put, you can set them right from the computer that's got control of them and, and it can tell it to take points at certain intervals during the day. It can tell it to take points um, more frequently, less frequently on the fly. And so depending on the data we're gathering, we can get a lot of information from those collars. Um, and some of the things that we use those collars for everything from what type of habitats are they using uh, during these periods of their life, whether it's, you know, for example, fawning time, winter, um, spring and summer, and then even during, the interesting thing about GPS is even during different temperatures, it'll, it'll record temperature of that spot where that animal's standing, and so it, we can then look at what was it doing during this temperature and, and things like that. And so it all kind of depends on the goal of our, of our study that we might be doing. Um, another thing a lot of times we look at is mortality. A GPS collar will instantly give you a signal, and some of the VHF will too, when it's not moving anymore. There's a little device in there that as long as the collar keeps moving during the day, um, it'll, and if it sits still for a certain amount of time, 
it'll send a signal out, a different signal. And so uh, we can then go in directly and see what reason it may have died. Um, and so it's, it's pretty good information to study pretty much the whole, the whole life of an animal just depending on how you set, set it up and what you're exactly looking at. Well, give us an example. Like, uh, what, two, three years ago, we put some collars, GPS collars on moose. Right. And so we had GPS collars on moose, and uh, a lot of it was looking at are these moose, for one, getting pregnant in the wild, and what are they, where are they going because we have moose that have moved into the south and west from their typical range in North Dakota. And so we looked at, you know, were they having calves, and how, were these calves then getting, you know, into the population as adults? And so we looked at we looked at that, and then and also we're going to correlate some information with temperature that hasn't those numbers and data haven't been analyzed yet. But with temperature and where they're at, we're going to look at some of that too to see if we can't figure out why we've had such a good success with the moose expanding in North Dakota. Now you said you've put transmitters on birds, small birds, mm -hmm. sharp-tailed grouse. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, well we've done a few things. The sharp-tailed grouse, one of we had some um, transmitters put on them, and part of that study was to see, you know, how human development may impact sharp-tailed grouse, whether that's roads, gravel pits, y you name it. It could be anything um, that we as humans do on the landscape. And so, and not only that, it was then to see in North Dakota how far some of these grouse may move from dancing leks and things like that, breeding grounds, and and then. Uh, and then, of course, when you have collars on or backpacks or whatever you call them on any type of animal, you try to get more information. And so we look at nesting success and things like that. How about the small, small birds? Yeah, we've even had been involved in a study um, through our state wildlife grants program that had little tiny um, devices put on songbirds essentially out in um, the western North Dakota. And those are mostly mixed short grass prairie type um, habitats that they were looking at and how these songbirds were using that nesting what might be predating on these birds and things like that and so yeah they can make them as small as your thumbnail uh, and, you know up to what they put on a moose is a pretty good sized sure. device. Um, we've done a lot of collars on whitetail and mule deer. The whitetail studies um, we've done four across the state in different areas of the state and actually there's a few other states that uh, did very similar, if not the same type of methods when they did the study. And so then we have somebody that's actually looking at those, all those studies together within the other states and, and North Dakota to kind of come up with maybe life history parameters in upper Great Plains type of thing. And so with all the data that is used with these collars and things, we can, we can correlate and maybe make some different type of management planning things as far as where we're at in the, st in the uh, region as well. Um, with mule deer, we had a study that had GPS collars on mule deer and it was tracking um, their movements and again their movements based on um, maybe human infrastructure, whether that's roads, um, gravel pits and things again. Uh, and it was out west and so there was a lot of traffic and things like that too, not only is a road in place but then there's traffic and stuff that's involved with the road and so um, and then also does that do those things affect the survivability of mule deer do those things affect our mule deer moving into a place where they're maybe using a secondary habitat versus their chosen habitat how is this information used in you know you've kind of mentioned some yep. in managing wildlife but how else is it used in managing our state's wildlife right and so a lot of things we can it either directly correlates to maybe management practices we're doing on the ground, whether it's um, management on our wildlife management areas or management um, through our plots program, those types of habitats that may need to be put in place that are maybe more important or less important um, during the life cycle. And so, you know, a lot of times in North Dakota, of course, with our bad winters, you know, a lot of times we assume that it's winter cover. Um, some of the things we found out with some of the deer studies is actually maybe fawning cover is just as important, if not maybe more important in some situations. Um, so that can direct our management as far as landscape management in North Dakota. 
Um, and the other thing that we can do is it sometimes directly correlates with the number of licenses that we may give out, um, whether or or the opportunities that we that we allow through our hunting seasons, um, depending on where animals are, where it, where they're not, you know, what types of habitats are suitable for a population of a certain type of animal, um, and so in that in that suitable habitat, we may limit because that's where we have a population that's viable and can grow and maintain itself. Outside of that habitat may be kind of an area where the habitat isn't suitable and so if we have animals over outside of suitable habitat it's maybe a, a spillover because there is extra in one area and, and sure. so they're moving out and moving around. Sure, so it, is it fair to say uh, you can do a lot more uh, with these Modern technology. Yes, modern technology has allowed us to do a lot more um, with limited hours, for sure, as far as man hours. Um, there is fees and things that go with it, and for the most part, you know, they do probably save the department money, too, as well. Um, into And then, of course, it helps us put our money on the ground better. The more information, the more data we can collect, the uh, better ability we have to put stuff on the ground in the right places. Sure. And, I mean, <coughs> biologists are still in the field. This yep. is a replacement of, of oh, yeah. people actually going out in the field. Yep. And in some cases, these GPS collars are so accurate that we can then send, say, our bighorn sheep that we have radio collared. Of course, we don't have the lambs radio collared as soon as they're, they're on the ground, but we know exactly where the mother is. And so we have our bighorn sheep biologists will go out then and during lambing season and just we'll be able to locate those sheep really easy in the Badlands. And then, and then observe the lambs, how many they have, do a lamb count. Um, it works with bighorn sheep because our population isn't real large. We couldn't, of course, do that with white-tailed deer because they're right. scattered all over the place. Okay. Do we have any future studies coming up here in the next year or two? Um, we do. We are looking to fit some uh, um, mallards with some radio devices. They're going to be GP. Well, actually, these are going to be, they're going to work off of cell phone towers. Oh. And they automatically triangulate, so they're kind of like a VHF collar, not quite a GPS collar. Um, technology is that as these mallards fly on their migration route, they'll pass just as many um, cell towers as we would if we drove it. And so uh, it'll then triangulate where their location is because we don't need quite the location we would with GPS for this study. Um, and then we're also looking at putting some radio collars, GPS collars, on some elk out west because we've done some studies in the northeast and then in Sioux County, and now we're looking to expand that out west, looking at, you know, elk movements and, and habitat use and things like that. A lot of good information, Casey. Thank yeah, you. You bet. There are a number of ways to connect with the Game and Fish Department. You can go to the Game and Fish website at gf.nd.gov. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. You can listen to weekly podcasts. You can sign up for emails on a variety of topics, including hunter education classes, news alerts, season updates, and more. Go to the Game and Fish website at gf.nd.gov. For Assistant Wildlife Division Chief Casey Anderson and the rest of the staff here at the Game and Fish Department, thanks for joining us this week for Outdoors Online. We'll see you again next week.